Practice makes perfect and other fairy tales. An introduction to practicing strategies, myths and tools for advanced students in preparation for the concert stage. For many, the idea of practicing has become synonymous with the idea of hours of endless repetition in a torture chamber, also known as a practice room, until you get it right. The problem with that premise is that repetition does not make perfect, it makes permanent. Repetition without comprehension leads to practicing in your mistakes. Repetitive strain injuries, boredom, mental fatigue, bored performers, boring playing, leading to bored audiences. A more deliberate approach. What happens on the concert stage is a direct consequence of what happens in the practice room. According to sports psychologist Don Green and performance psychologist Nawa Kahayama, we have a tendency to practice somewhat unconsciously, mindlessly repeating passages over and over until they sound better. However, as soon as we walk on stage, we end up trying to perform consciously. Our brain gets flooded with over-analytical thinking and criticism, which leads to preoccupation with technical details. We end up freaking out because we don't know what instruction to give our brains and we end up being unable to play as freely and automatically as we are capable of playing in our practice rooms. It might seem justifiable to tell yourself to just relax on stage and to try and duplicate the unconscious and mindless state of mind from our practice room. I think we all know how this scenario turns out. Instead, a better solution would be to rather duplicate that super conscious, analytical, detail oriented and critical state of mind found on the concert stage in our practice room. Practicing should be a deliberate, goal oriented detailed focus process of correction and experimentation in order to improve one's musical ability and of mastering music for performance. The violin pedagogue Ivan Galamayan proposed the methodical distribution of practice time into three. Building, which is purely technical. Interpretive, which is expressive detail. And performance practice, the integration of technique, musicianship, and performance related concerns when playing an entire piece. Performing is the culmination of stages of practice. In On Practicing, a manual for students of guitar performance, author Ricardo Isniola explains that there are two factors we must overcome in the practice room to be able to prepare for a public performance, inner and outer poise. Inner poise can be described as a mental state of alertness, as well as a heightened sense of curiosity and a readiness for intellectual activity without emotional tension and judgmental attitudes towards ourselves. Inner poise can only be achieved when the following conditions are met. 1. Emotional detachment from the material practiced. Similar to a scientist in a lab, we must observe the results of experiments and mistakes rather than condemning ourselves. Violinist Paul Cantor once said that the practice room should be like a laboratory where we can freely tinker with musical and technical ideas to see what combinations of ingredients produces the results we are looking for. 2. Objective observation of what we are doing and the results we are getting. If something is wrong in the practice room, it will not miraculously fix itself over time. We must observe the sensations and mechanisms of our playing and analyze the mistake. We should observe the mistake or discomfort, take note of it and then respond scientifically rather than react emotionally. We should see every incorrect note every technical flaw and inconsistency as a teachable moment. Deliberate practice involves monitoring one's performance and continuously looking for ways to improve. In a 2001 study by Cleary and Zimmerman, published in the Journal of Applied Sports Psychology, basketball experts, non-experts and novices were studied for differences in their practice habits. Most notably, their self-regulatory, forethought, and self-reflection processes regarding their three-throw shooting. Two main differences were distinguished. A. The experts and top athletes 
were very specific about the goals that they wanted to achieve during each practice session, whereas the amateur and bottom rated athletes had much broader goals. B. The experts and top athletes were able to attribute missed shots to specific technical problems that they would address in their next practice session, whereas the amateur and lower ranking athletes would often re react to failures emotionally and would attribute failures to vague, non-specific factors. Problem solving can be divided into three stages. A. Identification and isolation of the problem. B. Understanding the exact cause of the problem and finding the appropriate solution. C. Integrating and assimilating the appropriate solution through guided repetition, reinforcing the correct habits until they are stronger than the bad habits. Taking inspiration from industries outside the music sphere, the Kaizen approach. Kaizen is a Japanese term meaning change for the better or continuous improvement. It is a Japanese business philosophy regarding the processes that continuously improve operations and involves all employees. It was first practiced in Japanese businesses after World War II, most notably as part of the Toyota Way. Quick Kaizen, also known as 5S, is a workplace organization method that uses a list of five Japanese words translated as sort, set in order, shine, standardize, and sustain. How can this relate to practicing music? Good question. Sort identifying a specific passage or problem which you would like to address at the start of each practice session. Set in order, analyzing the cause of the problem and finding a solution. Shine, polishing the passage and integrating it with the rest of the piece of music. Standardize, create clear guidelines that can be implemented in the future to avoid similar technical problems. Sustain, incorporating the rectified passage or problem into future rehearsals as part of maintenance or performance practice. Three, ease of action in what we are doing. We should develop a keen sense of the minimum amount of physical effort needed to achieve the motion of playing and should continuously strive towards economy of movement through refined movement and outer poise. We should not allow difficulty, fatigue or pain to become part of our approach to playing an instrument. Our aim should not be short-term perfection in spite of physical unease, but rather being consistently accurate while being able to find joy in the physical performance. Isniana warns that when our inner voice is disturbed, we cannot practice optimally. We become so frustrated that we condemn ourselves due to our own incompetence. This leads to anxiety and physical tension, which in turn eliminates ease of action. We then stop listening objectively in order to protect ourselves from these painful feelings of inadequacy and condemnation, ultimately leading to loss of motivation and the desire to practice. Outer poise can be seen as the absence of dysfunctional tension and the achievement of ease of action. Hello, my name is Marja Otto. I'm currently a second year BMA student at Stellenbosch University. The pieces that I'm working on are gradually becoming longer and more complex. How do I maintain physical prosperity and avoid injuries when preparing for an important postgraduate edition, public exam or a solo recital? Hi there, so good day to everybody that's a part of the string convention 2020. Uh, my name is Brent January and um, I'm a third year BMA student specialising in performance at Stellenbosch University at the Conservatorium. So um, my, my current programme for the semester is um, Bach's Fugue in A minor, BWV 1000, uh, Fernando Soar's um, Variations on a Theme by Mozart, as well as um, Alta Camero Negro by Leo Brauer, as well as um, Lastly, Saudade number three by Roland Dion's. So, my question today is, 
as a performance student, practicing can take up so much of our, of our time, like daily. Um, and so my question today is how, do you, how does one set an effective practice routine or schedule um, and like how long should we practice for considering everything else that also has to be done. Um, it can be very overwhelming at times and it can sometimes feel like there's not enough hours in a day to finish up everything. So yeah, that's my question today. Hi, my name is Amanda van der Weestezen and I'm a final year guitar student at Stellenbosch University. Being a music student is a constant battle between balancing the demands of academic work and also finding time to practice. When you listen to repertoire on YouTube that you have to learn, it can become quite debilitating, the pressure of having to be perfect and getting it done in time. This can get to a point where it affects my practice. Do you have any advice? Thank you, Marius, Brent and Amanda. There are many factors that may affect our practice negatively. Let's discuss a few that are relevant to your situations. One, too little time. Not being able to find enough time to practice seems to be a recurring theme in every musician's life. How long should you be practicing? One of the 20th century's most iconic classical pianist, Arthur Rubinstein, stated that nobody should have to practice more than four hours a day explaining that if you needed to practice more than four hours a day, you're probably doing something wrong. According to Kahiyama, studies suggest that there is often little benefit from practicing more than four hours per day, and that gains gradually begin to decline after the two hour mark. The key is to limit practice sessions to a duration that allows you to stay focused. Two. Too much. The tendency to practice fragments that are too long or tackle too many projects at the same time. Chunking refers to a practice technique where one focuses on tiny sections of music. In the famous 1956 paper, The Magical Number 7, plus or minus 2, some limits on our capacity for processing information. American psychologist George Miller proposes a law of human cognition and information processing, in which humans can effectively process no more than seven units, or chunks of information. Using this premise, we should break down difficult passages into chunks of no more than seven items. For example, a complicated rhythm, a difficult shift, an extended technique, a fast passage, a large left hand stretch, or difficult right hand string crossings. Journaling. Try using a practice journal to keep track of your specific goals for each session and what you discovered during your practice sessions. Be specific about the goals you want to achieve during each practice session, focusing on your ability to attribute mistakes to specific technical problems that you can address in real time or in your next practice session. Taking inspiration from computer science and longer or new advanced repertoire. It can be difficult to prioritize which problem areas to work on first as the sheer volume of work that needs to be done may feel overwhelming. In Algorithms to Live By, The Computer Science of Human Decisions, authors Brian Christian and Tom Griffith show how algorithms developed for computers can show us how to deal with overwhelming choices when confronted with large amounts of work in combination with limited space and time. According to Christian and Griffith, humans and computers alike pay a penalty for starting a new task or interrupting the task that they're currently busy with. The penalty is reduced output or productivity. At the extreme, you can find yourself in a situation where you are so frantically switching your attention between so many different things that you fail to make progress on any of them in computer science, this is called thrashing. If you've encountered the giant spinning ball of doom, you've perhaps seen thrashing firsthand on your computer. Another solution is to stop wasting unnecessary time and resources on trying to prioritize the importance of problems or the order in which these problems should be solved. 
thus leaving more time for gradual practice and steering clear of the dreaded paralysis by analysis. 3. Too fast. We often have a tendency not to allocate enough slow practice and to practice the material at a performance tempo prematurely. According to Ryan Holiday, best-selling author of The Obstacle is the Way and Ego is the Enemy, in Stoicism, Buddhism and countless other schools of thought, we find the same analogy. The world is like muddy water. To see through it, we have to let things settle. During slow practice, the tempo should be slow enough to allow you to think before each note and to play without any mistakes while allowing enough time to think about what you want to say with every note, fine-tuning the execution while monitoring and analyzing every little detail. 4. Too difficult. The tendency to tackle works that are unrealistic for our current state of development. We cannot accelerate the growth of a tree by pulling its branches. Honest realism is a fundamental virtue for all performers. A novice guitarist recently asked Anna Krukina, a Russian decacord performer, on an Instagram post if she ever suffers from burnout from playing guitar all day. She responded that one should play what is easy for you and thereafter only increase the level of difficulty with 1%. It is impossible to burn out from playing what is only 1% more difficult than you are used to playing. If you repeat the process continuously, your progress will seem incredibly fast to everybody else. 5. Too much pressure. Practicing incorrectly negatively affects our confidence and we lose trust in our ability to overcome obstacles. This pressure is further exasperated by our tendency to compare ourselves to others. According to Kahayama, real on-stage confidence comes from knowing that this isn't a coincidence, but that you can perform a piece correctly on demand. Because you know exactly what you need to do from a technical perspective, in order to play the passage perfectly every time. Audiences do not attend concerts to compare previous performances with the current one. In many ways, a concert resembles many aspects of a love relationship. It is the unique attractiveness of your artistic message and personality that will make you successful. Audiences are, in this context, promiscuous. They have an unlimited capacity to fall in love with all possible unique artistic messages and personalities. Isniola, 2000. Quote from the Roman emperor and Stoic philosopher Marcus Aurelius's Meditations. It never ceases to amaze me. We all love ourselves more than other people, but care more about their opinion than our own. Letting go of past negative experiences and criticism, acting bravely, finding confidence while avoiding ego, are just some of the inner battles we must fight as musicians. I bid you farewell with this quote by Theodore Roosevelt and wish you many hours of happy practicing. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marked by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. But who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat.